All right, good evening. Sorry. If you would turn your Bibles to First Chronicles chapter 29. First Chronicles chapter 29. As we finish up the book of Chronicles this evening. The last chapter in it, chapter 29. So trust everything's going well and trust everybody logging on is doing good. So uh, we're all set to go. All right, let's go before the Lord in prayer and we'll pick it up at verse 1. Father, now as we just spend time, Lord, in your word, Lord, hearing from you and reading your word, and we pray that you would just continue to move in and through our hearts and through our midst, Lord. Um, uh, Lord, we know you want to speak to us. We know that you love us. We know that you got a, a wonderful plan for our lives, Lord, and we just pray that we'd be drawn closer to you this evening, Lord, for we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. I just encourage you guys that are logging on home to have your Bibles open, just like at church. Um, you know, I encourage you to maybe find a place that's pretty quiet so that, you know, you got a quiet place to to be there to hear from the Lord as well. And um, I know you'll always get more out of it when we follow along in the Bible and when we can give our attention over to the Lord. All right, well, as I said, we've come to the last chapter in the book of Chronicles, uh, First Chronicles, that is, and it's really the final chapter in David's life as well. Um, it, it's really just, uh, we won't hear from him again. Uh, obviously, when we come up, we'll read about him, and, and, and he'll always be a reference of, this is what a godly king was, this is what a king was that was after my heart or desire to do my way. So we'll hear that uh, over and over again, but uh, we, we won't be back visiting from David's life specifically like this um, again for quite a while. So, although we will visit him in the Psalms, but um, so we've kind of slowed down to take the last few chapters here. And then next week we'll pick it up with Solomon and him building the temple and then go from there. So again, David's just giving us um, the last few words of encouragement the uh, last few words of uh, you know encouragement for the people and for the for Solomon to to take action. He's gathered the who's who of the country, all the leaders, all those uh, respected people that would follow uh, and be there after him, and the military leaders, the the Levites, the priests, and and all those other family heads that would be all. Uh, you know, part of the ruling, and then everybody else that I imagine that wanted to be there. And he did that on purpose because he wanted them to hear and to watch and observe everything uh, that was going on, that they would be encouraged. And not only that, but they would also encourage Solomon as well uh, to stay, uh, you know, connected. And that's important that they're all connected. They're all in this together. And David uh, knows that Solomon's young and he needs the encouragement. The people know there's going to be a change uh, on the throne and they need to be encouragement. Everybody needed to work together to accomplish the things of the Lord and to stay close to the Lord through all this. And so David is literally doing that. And so verse 1 says, uh, Furthermore, King David said to all the assembly, My, Solomon, my son Solomon, who... Uh, uh, whom alone God has chosen is young and inexperienced, and the work is great because the temple is not for man, but for the Lord God. And again, we spent a lot of time in this last week when David was talking about Solomon and encouraging Solomon and encouraging all the people to encourage Solomon as well. Uh, you know, he's got a calling on his life, and yes, he is going to be the king, but he's a kid. Uh, you know, he was about 16 years old, maybe as young as 14, maybe 18, so somewhere in that range. You know, he's a teenager. And uh, again, uh, there was a calling on him, uh, you know, to, to rule that God's calling on his life and also was to build the temple. And so um, just remember how wonderful it is to have people who will come into our lives to encourage us, to remind us, to spur us on. And I think that's important uh, as well. That's just a, a great part of the Christian life and something that as we're younger, we receive 
and something as we get older that we give, and it always needs to be that way. Uh, particularly the young, uh, the young in faith, and the young in, in age as well, and the things of the Lord. You know, they need to be encouraged. They need to be reminded. They need to be spurred on so that they'll continue and not grow frustrated or uh, get distracted or, uh, you know, become so unsure that they can't really make decisions or move forward because of those things. And and uh, it's great that, uh, that people will come alongside, whether in his day or in our day today, um, t- to do that. And we should either, you know, be receiving encouragement or giving out encouragement. It's just something we're all called to do and to spur them on and to remind them, you know, of God's calling or God's plan. And even if you don't know it, you say, you know, God's got a calling. God's got a plan because all those things are true. And the young, again, in particular, need to hear that. But, of course, we all need to hear it at various times in our lives and we all need to be those that either receive that when it's given or, or give it out as well. Remember, David has set up everything, but encouragement still needs to happen because there's going to come obstacles and there's going to be coming those distractions. And, you know, we see people today that have gifts and abilities or blessings, and it's always important that we encourage them to do that. When we see that, you know, God's got a gift. God's got a calling on your life. And, uh, you know, I, I've seen it. And I, I just pray that you will continue to to feed that fire, to be encouraged to use that gift. Um, it's a great, important part of the body of Christ. And one of the important reasons that that the Lord has put together the church, you know, is why we don't stay at home and do our own things and, you know, kind of watch, although we're in an unusual season, granted, remotely, but ultimately, you know, and things have to change. We need each other and we need to interact with each other. And these are important parts of that interaction and why we're called to to be the church here. And so uh, we see that in this day. We see it in our day as well. Well, then David says in verse two, now, for the house of my God, I have prepared with all my might gold for the things to be made of gold and silver for the things of silver, bronze for the things of bronze, iron for the things of iron, wood for the things of wood, onyx stones, stones to be set, glistening stones of various colors, all kinds of precious stones and marble slabs in abundance. You know, I just like that in verse 2 that he's prepared with all his might. And we have been reading about that for the last few weeks now. He's been saving up everything for the building of the temple. You know, whenever they would uh, receive these spoils from wars or, you know, they would uh, conquer a nation or, you know, the nation would come in and attack them and they would have victory. Well, they were able to, you know, to... Uh, you know, go in and gather uh, their valuables. That's what that's what spoils are. And, uh, you know, from all the wars they fought and all the people that just gave, you know, there was plenty of other nations that that realized that David was, you know, God's man and he was ruling the area. And so they wanted to be in good with them. And so they would also give tribute, they call it to them. And we notice that David did this saving up those materials with all his might or with all his ability. This this is how I kind of picture it. And I don't know if this helps you and all, but, you know, I can imagine, you know, they just had this victory and, uh, you know, they defeated the Ammonites or something that, you know, that came against and fought them. And so, you know, that he walks into uh, the treasury of that nation or into the the king's palace or something and he sees all this stuff there and maybe gold and stones or or you know crowns with things on them everything and i can just see dave thinking man that would be great for the temple you know we could really use that and we could put those stones here or man he's got a lot of great you know resources here of of, of you know silver or this is great you know polished bronze that would just be great you know i can't imagine him you know doing all this going around thinking wow that would just be that would just be great and you know oh then these 
this country just brought us a bunch of, you know, uh, of tribute, you know, money, you know, to show that they support us and they want us, you know, on their good side. And man, we could really use that over there. And boy, this would be great. You know, I, I, I just see that's how David's heart was rather than like most people were thinking, wow, look at that gold, man. That'll be great, man. I'll be able to buy this and get this, or that will go great in my house, or that will go great in my bank account, or that will look great on my trophy shelf. You know, that's not what David's heart was. Though, you know, many would look at it that way. His heart was set on God, on God's kingdom and not his. What a great example to follow in that. Not just patting his own, you know, uh, living and money and banking and, you know, reserves and ability to have more and get more and, and do more. You know, when these things came in and, and, and all that was available after these battles or was brought to them, you know, with all his might, he's thinking, man, this would just be great. Oh, great. We could use more gold because we could, you know, this is a great for another, the next menorah now. We can build that for the temple. Or, you know, this will be great to overlay, you know, some of the, the, the instruments that we need. You know, the, we need short, you know, wick trimmers and uh, things to put out the candles. And we need stuff to turn over the offerings when it comes. You know, all these kind of things. Stuff for the incense, big bowls to mix. You know, that would be great for that. That was his heart. Not a man, that's great. I'll have more gold in my bank and, uh, you know, add to my house and I'll have all these beautiful things there. It was like, no, let's, man, what, what a great blessing that will be for the house of God. And I, I think that was a great example, you know, to see and follow and have such a, a, a godly king or leader that was, whose heart was, you know, working with that with all his ability. You know, most kings, probably every other king was thinking about how much more they can get. And man, if I have this much resources, I can support more wives and have more chariots and get more horses and, have, you know, or whatever. The newest car, get a bigger house, get a vacation house, be able to take a cruise, you know, maybe uh, charter my own plane for my next vacation, you know, have this, get this, have all that. Not David's heart. Well, wow, we could use this all to see, you know... Uh, for, for the Lord and for the temple that he know that I know he wants built. Well, then he goes on in verse three. Moreover, because I have set my affection on the house of my God, I have given to the house of my God over and above all that I have prepared for the holy house, my own special treasure of gold and silver, 3000 talents of gold of the gold of Ophir, which means it was you know, really pure gold, right? And 7,000 talents of refined silver to overlay the walls of the houses, the gold for things of gold and for silver, the things of silver and for all kinds of work to be done by the hands of the craftsmen. Now, get this. So David set apart you know, of the income that was coming into the nation and, and, and victories they, they got in war and all that stuff. Yes, there was, there was, you know, set aside, uh, uh, you know, some of that for, you know, the people that got some of it. It was split a number of, of ways. You know, that was something that was set, established way back in Moses and even David added to it a little bit later on. We've talked about in the past, but, and then, you know, you know, commanders would get so on, you know, soldiers and so forth and this and that. And then David would take a percentage of that that would come in for the, for the temple. But it just wasn't that. You see, David wasn't just giving away what kind of came into the nation. He was also giving what was his from his own bank account, maybe we'd say in this day. And, you know, a talent is about 75 pounds. Uh, you know, I've heard some people say as high as 100 and low as 66. I think 75 is probably the more accurate number that I've seen, although I've heard numbers kind of all over. But just roughly for sake, 75 uh, pounds per talent. And so um, if you were to take that, David's, uh, uh, what he offered in gold is about 3.6 million ounces. Because we measure gold because it's so valuable by the ounce, not by the pound and not by the ton, <laughs> by the ounce, because it's so, you know, valuable. So he gave 3.6 million ounces. And again, this wasn't 
you know, you can get more weight out of gold if it has some impurities in it, right? It weigh a little bit more, have a little more value to it, even though it wasn't really as good gold. But this is the, the high quality stuff, the 24 karat gold we'd say today. And then he gave 8.4 million ounces of silver. You know, in today's economy, billions of dollars worth of gold and silver. That was just from his own bank account. On top of all that other that we just talked about that he had given in the, in the last week or so we've been talking about. But this was his. David knew how to give. Now, why is David saying this? Hey, I gave, you know, yeah, we set all aside that as a nation. We set all that stuff aside. But I want to tell you, this is what I'm giving out of my own personal bank account, we'd say. I, I want to give this. Now, why is David saying that to the assembly? To get attention? To get some attaboys? To say, wow, David, you're a great guy? No, he's dying. I mean, literally dying. He doesn't care about any of those things anymore. Not at all. That has, that has nothing to do with it. The reason he is saying that is this, the last sentence in verse 5. Who then is willing to consecrate himself this day to the Lord? Or can I put it in, in this way? Who's with me on this? Yeah, as a nation, we put aside all this for the building of it and for all that, yep. But I want you to know, I'm personally going to give a huge amount of money, and I don't know how much he had, you know, in the bank, but I'm going to give a huge amount, you know, of that, you know, towards this project as well. Who's with me on this? He'd say to the crowd, you know, consecrate. The idea is who's going to set themselves aside to do the same thing? You know, he's encouraging others, and again, this has a great representation of who's who in the nation, plus probably tens of thousands of other citizens, you know, uh, of the nation that came there to follow along with his generous giving. And again, what a great example. He's saying all this to encourage others to be generous like he is generous towards the things of the Lord. And now just think about us. And how about us? You know, do we gripe and complain about how cheap how cheap people can be or who are, you know, are always pinching pennies but are critical when others do the same to us? You know, sometimes, oh, man, they really didn't spend much on that. They didn't put much effort into that gift or this effort or what, you know, ever they did here. And it's, you know, man, you know, I'm talking about, you know, cheapskate, some penny pincher, this and that or whatever. And, and then, you know, and then we find ourselves being the same way. Um, are we looking for someone to be generous to us, yet never displaying generosity? You know, don't we want when we're receiving something or getting something or when the boss is handing out raises or when there's bonuses coming around or, or when there's gifts being given or something? I mean, personally, when we want, you know, when we're rece on the receiving end of that, we want those kind of people to be generous, right? Yet, do we ever display that sort of generosity? You know, David is leading by example. And there is so much in Scripture that talks about this. There, there's so much. And it's, I'll limit it to a couple of verses here. But Matthew, you know, 7, 2 kind of says this. And I kind of like that. Uh, you know, part of the Beatitudes. And the measure you give will be the measure you get. Or the measure you be, the, the measure you meet, the old, that you meet, the old King James says, is the measure that will be given back to you again. Or, or maybe I can put it this way in 2 Corinthians uh, chapter 9, verse 6. Remember this, whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly, and whoever sows generously will also reap generously. And, and the idea, and again, there's, there's so much of this found in Scripture. It, it, you know, we could spend a whole topic on this, a whole time on this. But just know, you know, that's the heart of God. 
He is generous towards us, and we can all say amen on that without reservation, right? I mean, he, we know he has been above and beyond. And yet, are we generous towards the Lord? David is setting an example in his giving, and the question is, do we? Or are we known as the cheapskate? You know, I, I I have met and know a number of people that, man, you know, when you go out to eat or you go get a coffee at Starbucks or, you know, you're somewhere there, man, that wallet, you know what somebody used to say? They have short arms and deep pockets. <laughs> they can't ever seem to get to their wallet because it's so far away, Right. And then there are others, you know, that, man, oh, the bill's coming. The first thing they're doing is grabbing for their wallet and getting out their, their, their card or their cash to, to, oh, let me take care of that. Let me pay for that. You know, that are just, uh, you know, you know what that's like. You've been around both people and, you know, uh, you know what that's like. And, 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 and we all know how great it is for, for, for those that are generous. I just remember one time going out to lunch with somebody and, um, you know, they just expected me to pay for lunch. Now, I was going to pay for lunch anyway, but it really bothered me that they thought that I should buy them lunch for some reason. And this wasn't like, you know, this was just kind of like, hey, let's go to lunch together kind of a thing, right? And, you know, uh, let's like have lunch. And, uh uh, you know, this was a number of years ago, and I just, you know, when it came to pay the bill, I was, you know, like, anyway, enough said. But we know what it's like to be around those people that are, that that are, you know, real slow on that, and they're real quick. And, and you know, let's be the people that are quick. Because we want to be blessed, certainly, and we want to display the heart of God. David certainly is doing that here and he's encouraging others to do the same and our lives can reflect that in great ways and it just shows you know a huge again i could we could talk about this for a long time but it just shows a huge degree of trust and of love and of appreciation for the things of god it really does and people that have a good handle on that are generous people and you know them and i know them and Boy, they are a blessing. And David's doing the same thing to these guys here. So he's saying what he's given, and then he's saying, who's with me on this? And let's see the response. Uh, verse 6, Then the leaders of the father's houses, the leaders of the tribes of Israel, the captains of the thousands and of hundreds, with the officers over the king's work, offered willingly. They gave for the work of the house of God 5,000 talents and 10,000 uh, derricks of gold of gold, 10,000 talents of silver, 18,000 talents of bronze, and 100,000 talents of iron. And whoever had precious stones gave them to the treasury of the house of the Lord into the hands of Jehiel the Gershonite. And, and so when, you know, they saw David and, uh, you know, uh, you know, what he was doing and his encouraging words, you notice that they gave willingly. And they gave, you know, as far as the precious gold and silver, you know, they about doubled what David gave, plus, you know, the other uh, iron and, and the bronze as well. And they roughly just, you know, it, it just encouraged them to do the same thing. Again, it's so important that we set the example to encourage others to see the blessing of giving. And they gave willingly. You know, it's sad to me, but just in general terms, um, in general terms about, uh, of any particular church that I've known or heard about, and again, this is just in rough terms, but about 10% of the people in the church body are the ones that support about 90% of the need in, in the church. You know, there's always about 10% and they, they meet the needs uh, of the church, about 90% of the needs of the church. It's pretty sad that the small amount of people that want to be generous and see the scriptural 
uh, uh, precedent and see and understand and know the blessing of giving and, and, and you know, demonstrating that. It's just amazing how, how small it is. But sadly, it's true. And, and um, you know, it's just all the more important that we uh, remember the wonderful in, influence we can be. And not only that, but verse 9 as well says, Then the people rejoiced, for they had offered willingly, because with a loyal heart they had offered willingly to the Lord. And King David also great rejoiced greatly. So when he did that, just re, just notice there wasn't um, this pressure tactics of giving now who's going to give i'm going to close the back doors until i hear five people give an offering of a thousand dollars or before this happens you know there's all sorts of ways people and you know churches do it and all kinds of tactics to make you feel and give stories and show puppy dog eyes and children with flies on their eyelids and noses and give money don't you want to give money to these poor people and you know there's all sorts of pressure tactics and you know, beaten, um, uh, you know, over the head and making him feel guilty about not giving. And, and that's not what happened here. David was like, hey, this is what I'm giving. Who's with me? Yeah, we're with you, Dave. And then everybody was blown away and excited. It was all done willingly. No forcing, no like, oh, okay, I, you know, I'm one of the leaders. I guess I should give, right? You know, everybody else is giving. I guess I should throw a few bucks on the, the offering plate as it goes by or in the box in the back or whatever it is. No, it wasn't like that at all. They also rejoiced. David rejoiced. There was great rejoicing in this. Being generous is contagious. And, and I just like how it all went down with great joy. You know, uh, a number of years ago, many years ago now, I, I spent a short period of time in this Assembly of God church. Um, and uh, one of the things I liked about uh, them um, was when it came time to do the offering, they would put on this um, really, you know, they would put on, they would they would play this great upbeat um uh, song. I mean, it was just like a, you know, toe tapping, get you swaying and moving kind of song, you know, to the Lord, a worship song, you know, a praise song, I guess, more accurately. And, you know, it'd just be playing and, and they had a way of doing it. The, the ushers would be at the front of the church, you know, uh, on the front of each rows and they would have like an offering, a little bigger than maybe an offering bag and they would hold it up there. And what the people would do is they would walk forward and put their offerings inside these bags. And, and you know, I have some issues with some of that thing, but one of the things I liked about it was that, you know, those ushers were up there and they were kind of dancing back and forth because, you know, the music was going and it's an AG church, right? Assemblies of God. <laughs> They're going like this. And, but, you know, what I liked about it was it was just, they were, they were putting on... Um, a, a display of joy in, in the giving. It wasn't like, okay, now let's give and pass the ushers and there's somebody singing a song and, and you know, that's okay and it's going around and, you know, it's kind of a time we have to do and, and this and that. It, it wasn't like that. And I kind of like that um, about just the whole idea was to really liven the place up because it was an opportunity to give. And, um, you know, that's what was going on here. It, this generosity was, was contagious and, and, and everybody was willingly doing it. There was no manipulation. And again, I'll, I'll read that the next verse here um, in 2 Corinthians uh, chapter 9, verse 7. Each man should give what he has decided in his heart to give. And note this part, not reluctantly or under compulsion, which means you have to, or not grudgingly, reluctantly, for God loves a cheerful giver. See, what was going on here in this story in First Chronicles chapter 29 is exactly what this verse is teaching here in the New, in the New Testament 
in first and second Corinthians chapter nine. God loves a cheerful giver. And what he saw going on at this point was people loving to give. And he loved that. And they loved giving. I can't explain to you enough how that just goes hand in hand. We want to be a channel. We want to be a giver. We want to be the first ones to open up our wallet, not the last, and see what happens. You know, there's going to be great joy. Why? Because our Heavenly Father is the greatest giver. And so because of this and because of the joy that was going on and because David was blown away by what he saw, the people were blown away and rejoicing at what they saw. And because of all this, you know, and, and watching all this and David seeing all this, he can't contain himself. He kind of breaks out in this great praise uh, for the next, uh, you know, three or four verses here. And let's, let's read them. He says, therefore, blessed uh, therefore, David blessed the Lord before all the assembly. And David said, Blessed are you, Lord God of Israel, our Father, forever and ever. Your, yours, O Lord, is the greatness, the power and the glory, the victory and the majesty. For all that is in heaven and in earth is yours. Yours is the kingdom, O Lord, and you are exalted as head over all. Both riches and honor come from you, and you reign over all. In your hand is power and might. In your hand it is to make great and to give strength to all. Now, therefore, our God, we thank you and praise your glorious name. But who am I and who are my people that we should be able to offer so willingly as this? For all things come from you, and of your own we have, uh, we have given you. And if you like to underline that last part of the verse there is just great. You know, David just sees this, the people are rejoicing, he's rejoicing, and this beautiful praise uh, comes out of his lips, you know, because of the generous hearts. And then David acknowledges before everybody, where does the money come from? From hard work? From your company? Because you're good with money? No, it comes from the Lord. And so David said, honor him with it. Act like it's from him. Be like he is with you and notice that they were all willing to give that's the great thing that's the important thing to see in this you know it comes from him you're only giving back what he has given to you in the first place so we need to honor him with it and act like it's from him not like it's from my hard work so i need to I need to hold on to a lot of this because, you know, this is my hard work. Man, if you think like that, you're going to be a cheapskate towards God. You know, uh, it comes from him. He's given it to you. <laughs> it shouldn't be so hard to pry it out of our hands. But if we forget where it came from and who provided for all that, then not so much, right? The perspective is completely different. And then when we realize that, we give willingly, it brings joy, it makes, give. we're blessed, the Lord's blessed, people are blessed because of it. Just a wonderful thing, a wonderful thing. Well, verse 15 says this, for we are aliens and pilgrims before you as were all our fathers our days on earth are as a shadow and without hope O lord our god all this abundance that we have prepared to build you a house for your holy name is from your hand and is all your own So David just realizes I'm just passing through. 
you know, without you, there isn't any hope. My life is like a shadow. Do you ever pay attention to a shadow? It's there, it's gone. You, you know, days on earth are just very quick. And, you know, this life, we're just passing through. You know, we're a pilgrim. Um, I always like to, instead of saying an alien or pilgrim, I like to think of that word, think of that as like on vacation. You know, we're like going, our life down here is like a vacation. When you go on a vacation somewhere, you go camping for a week, you just bring what you need for that week because, you know, you're not going to pack your refrigerator and your washer and dryer. You're not going to, you know, take your sofa and your big screen TV. You're not going to take your, you know, your suit and tie or your dresses or anything. You just, you, you have what you need and you need it because that's what's going to be. And then eventually you're going to have everything when you go home. And it's like that we're passing through this life. And, uh, and, and again, it, realize that everything has come from you and we're blown away david said by how much you've given to us that we're able to now put towards what we know you want to have come to pass which is in this case is to build the temple and you know it's all from you it's all from you it's all from you david's repeating that i hope we can grasp that it's from him Well, then David continues in verse 17. I know also, my God, that you test the heart and have pleasure in uprightness. And as for me, the, the uprightness of my heart, I have willingly offered all these things. And now with joy, I have seen your people who are present here to offer willingly to you. O Lord God of Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, our fathers, keep this forever in the intent of of the thoughts of the heart of your people and fix their heart towards you. <laughs> Man. And then he adds for his son Solomon, and give my son Solomon a loyal heart to keep your commands and your testimonies and your statues to do all these things and to build the temple for which I have made provisions. <laughs> you know, David just finishes off here um, you know, with this great praise and, you know, look at Lord, I'm blown away with just amazed what you're doing and what everybody's doing and how willingly and how wonderful all this is. Lord, I pray that this would just continue to happen generation after generation, that people would always have this heart towards you. And I want my son in particular who has to lead them to be the same way. You see, David knew it wasn't about outward religious acts, but a heart after the things of our Heavenly Father is what everybody needs. And so he's seeing it happen here. He's seeing it happen and he prays that it will just continue to happen as, as the nation, as generations comes, as this next generation, as he's moving off the scene and going home to be with our Heavenly Father. He said, man, that this next one would do it and my son would be right in the center of all that. And I know it's just not about doing and, and this and checking the boxes off. I went to church, I read my Bible, I prayed, I did this, I didn't do this and all that kind of stuff. No, it's not about outward acts. It's about a heart after the things of our Heavenly Father. And I pray that everybody would continue to grow in that, David would say because that's what stirred up the giving and realizing it's all from him and you know we're you know all of it lord is from you and we're accomplishing what you want to do through the work that you're using us to do and channeling those things towards your purposes and your will and it's just great to be uh, uh, uh to go along for the ride and be a part of that and be that that vessel for you and I can imagine the joy that was there. And I think we really see it here in verse 20. Then David said to all the assembly, Now bless the Lord your God. So all the assembly bless the God of their fathers. You know, it's kind of like, can I hear an amen? <laughs> and they're all like, yeah, right? And then they bowed their heads and prostrated themselves before the Lord. 
and the king. They're acknowledging, wow, they're overwhelmed. And then it says, then they made sacrifices to the Lord and offering, burnt offerings to the Lord on the next day, a thousand bulls, a thousand rams, a thousand lambs, and their drink offerings and their sacrifices in abundance for all Israel. So they ate and drank before the Lord with great gladness on that day. And so all of that was that you know, this culmination of, man, this great celebration, rejoicing what the Lord's doing, what's going on here. And, and then they have this huge, you know, they acknowledge it and then they have this huge barbecue and other offerings too. You know, the burnt offerings were like, you know, completely dedicating to the Lord. That was the idea. But there was also other ones where they would just, you know, be sharing the meal together, this huge barbecue. Um, the other day, Ethan and I were, at the doctor's office to get our allergy shots and our the doctor's parking lot uh is uh, is right at the back of freedom meat locker <laughs> and they were barbecuing something there man i'm telling you it smelled so good and you know you could smell that barbecue fill the the parking lot there and i, I don't know i sorry it brings I mean, the only one that brings an Ethan to our mind that, but I can imagine that that smell was going out, right? You know, this big celebration, everybody is rejoicing, and and, and you know, uh, there was just so much blessing and so much excitement going on um, at this time, seeing how go how good God is and what He's done. Now, we're just about ready to finish. I do want to show this short video because we've been talking for weeks now about all this gold and the jewels and um, the silver and the bra uh, bronze and all those great building materials. And this is a short little video. It, it's got some inaccuracies in it. There's a couple things that I, I, I don't see are in the Bible. I'll point them out as we kind of go through this. Um, but... Um, I, I think it's a great thing overall to see, you know, kind of what the temple looked like when it was finished, when all those building materials and all that, what all the gold and all that expensive stuff went into. And so if you want to look at this real quick and give your attention to the screen and you're going to put it on there and I'll, I'll start this here. Well... Of course, it worked when. Uh, I pushed it and I pushed it twice. Sorry, guys, we're trying to get it. Um, it's there and it's not work. Oh, it's just, you know, I tried it. Okay, just hold it down. I'm holding it. I'm pushing it. Uh, is it going? Oh, I'm sorry. It's up there, and I'm I'm not saw on my screen. My dumb. Here we go. We'll start again. <laughs> I realize it wasn't there. Okay, let's take a look at it. Sorry, it wasn't playing on mine. So here's what it looks like on the, on the overall. And you have it kind of focus on there so you can see. Here's the outside of it um, of what it kind of looks like. That's the altar. And now this is about thirty feet thirty feet by thirty feet and about fifteen feet high. That gives you some idea. That's the bronze altar where they would offer a lot of their sacrifice. So a lot of bronze went there uh, on that. Then, of course, a lot of this bronze made these huge bronze laver and all these bronze uh, bowls and everything that held this thing up for the water. They would use it to do ceremonial washing of themselves and of the animal. Some parts had to be washed and they would use the water for that. But this was this was a huge... And then they made 10 of these carts so they can move it around on particular holidays where they needed water in more places uh, when a lot of sacrifices. And then these are bronze capitals um, that went all the way to the top. Uh, the, the, we'll see in Second Chronicles, it talks about chain on there. And here's the door going into it. So over gold on everything. So this is going into the, the first room or the holy ho uh, um holy place thank you so you get an idea i mean this is you know uh three stories four stories high and look at all the gold overlaying on the floor and all the workmanship and the walls 
and even some you know ex thought there was jewels put into the walls as well uh, the menorah there was 10 of them made out of solid gold the floor was gold um, the ceiling was gold the, you know all these there was gold everywhere they would put these capitals on top of them and they were all of gold and so you know all this gold was was used on this of course the table of showbread um, uh, had gold overlaid with some wood. The altar of incense was solid gold as well. And then going up to the, the Holy of Holies, um, well, the altar of incense there, that was all solid gold as well. Now, it says this was a curtain, so it's one of the things I would disagree with. There wasn't doors there. It was a curtain. We'll talk about that next time. But the Holy of Holies, here's the Ark of the Covenant at the bottom here. And I don't really think the cherubim are really good in reflecting what the cherubim look like. They kind of have an Egyptian look to them on the front, but that's my opinion there. But again, these things were um, each wing of the cherubim. So from this tip to that tip was about seven and a half feet. And then there was the body and then another seven and a half feet. So they touched the wall, they touched each other, and all that was all gold. And, it's, and again, I'm not sure why they put doors there. We know it was a curtain um, when we get to Second Chronicles. But uh, it just gives you some sense of, you know, all that gold and those building materials. And, of course, we're not seeing the iron and all the other stuff in construction uh, with all the other construction parts of it there. And then, of course, later on, this would be Solomon's palace and, you know, his throne room and all that kind of stuff. But anyway, I thought that was a, a great just idea to see where um, all those building materials uh, went and um, you know just get an idea of how beautiful it was and then people just gave so generously and it just blessed everybody and so um, let's finish up in verse 26 thus David the son of Jesse reigned over all Israel the period of his reign over Israel was 40 years, seven years he reigned in Hebron, and 33 years he reigned in Jerusalem. And he died in a good old age, full of days and riches and honor, and Solomon and his son reigned in his place. Now the acts of King David, first and last indeed, they are written in the books of Samuel the seer, and the book of Nathan the prophet, and the book of Gad the seer, and all his reign and his might, and the events that happened to him in to Israel and to all the kingdoms of the lands. And so God gives us this great record of him and he wants us to know how he feels about David and David feels about him. And all we can say is what a joy it is to be committed to our Heavenly Father. Amen? Let's pray. Father, we thank you for these great lessons, Lord, and this great lessons in, you know, being generous towards you and the things of you, Lord. Um, there's such blessings found there. And those of us that you've experienced these things know well what I'm saying, Father. But I pray that you would reveal to others, maybe that have been slow or new or um, really haven't come to understand those things, um, Father, that you would show them that it's a great thing. It's not benefiting or not benefiting a particular church or group or this or that. They, Father, uh, a person needs to look past all that. Uh, they're, they're giving it to you. That's, that's the point. And, and uh, when we give willingly and generously, Lord, you're just, you're blessed. You love it. And we love it. It's just a, a great and wonderful thing. And help us to be those people, to grow in that, to be great examples of that, and to encourage those around us uh, to do the same, Lord. Uh, it just, uh, it can't help but to bring a, a great peace and joy and understanding and this um, great and wonderful work in the lives of your people, Lord. Help us to, to see all that, Lord. Draw us close and Lord, teach us, for we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.